So hello, today we will speak about the history of the Polish socialist movement, Polish socialist movement in the time uh, when Polish was under occupation in the partition. And we will talk about a very important subject, the question of independence, that because Polish the socialist movement was divided about this question and our guest is Mateusz Kiskorski. He will present this question. Thank you and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, well, the question itself is uh, quite complex uh, because uh, as we all know, the Polish socialist uh, movement was uh, active in different parts of the partitioned country. So actually the Polish socialist movements was a part of uh, the socialist movements of uh, <coughs> three countries which were part uh, participating in the uh, partition of Poland, which means uh, Austria-Hungary, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire, and uh, the German Empire. So, uh, depending on uh, the political, local political conditions of uh, all those uh, mentioned countries, the socialist uh, movement was uh, developing in different ways. So, I would say that. I don't know, Michal, if you would agree with me that uh, the most uh, active and uh, intellectually productive part of the socialist movement of Poland was uh, actually developing in the Russian uh, part of uh, our country, in the part which belonged to Russian Empire. And of course, it was uh, an effect, a result of uh, intellectual discussions and uh, let's say, different intellectual movements as well as the role of the so-called uh, let's say social class or group uh, created uh, in the conditions of russian empire called uh, intelligentsia i think it was quite a unique uh, social uh, movement uh, social group uh, with a very specific uh, feeling of uh, social public and political mission and uh, uh, that's why my my first uh, thesis here would be that uh, the most interesting discussions took place uh, actually in the Russian controlled part of uh, our country. And of course, also that the, the part uh, controlled by Russian was uh, also a part of uh, the all Russian socialist movement in uh, different parts of uh, the empire, as we all know the Polish socialists, but also the Polish anarchists, by the way, were quite active in uh, uh, the public life of uh, the revolutionary movement, anti-Tsarist movement in uh, all the Russian Empire. We know about uh, the guy who killed uh, the Tsar in uh, 1881. It was uh, uh, Ignacy Hryniewiecki, a Polish guy. We know about a lot of revolutionaries participating in the Russian revolutionary movement. Uh, of course, it was not only the Marxist movement, it was also the movement before, let's say, uh, Plehanov and uh, the others. So it was also the movement uh, which was uh, uh, called uh, Narodnaya Volia, uh, People's Will, or Zemlya uh, i Volia, so uh, the land and uh, the people. So uh, actually, it was quite interesting to see uh, as uh, the, the, the movement, the socialist revolutionary movement, in particularly in this part of uh, Poland, became uh, active not only on the intellectual level, which was quite typical for intelligentsia as a social class and social group, but also on this uh, level of activism, on this level of uh, revolutionary activism as well. So uh, when it comes to your question, well, I would say that, uh, of course, we had uh, basic two currents in within the socialist movement of Poland. One was speaking about uh, the independence. And, uh, well, it was not, uh, a, actually, it was not a reformist movement because uh, a lot of uh, the so-called uh, in, in the independent uh, socialists in Poland uh, who placed on the first place the independence of uh, of Poland as uh, the most important goal of their movement and of, of their activity, 
were quite inspired by uh, the works, the writings of uh, Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich Engels. Uh, actually, they were referring to uh, a lot of works and uh, let's say references of uh, Marx and uh, Engels as well uh, to the Polish question, as we all know. Uh, Marx uh, referred several times to the Polish questions, uh, to the Polish question, to the question of Polish independence, actually. Uh, perceiving the um, uh, Polish fight for independence as, uh, uh, let's say, a part of revolutionary uh, movement in uh, in Europe, in, in Europe ringed by uh, the empires, by uh, the monarchies. So uh, that was quite interesting that the Part, at least part of the Polish Marxist movement at that time, <clears throat> inspired by Marx, not being too reformist at that time. Uh, the reformist is a matter of uh, the times of, uh, let's say, the First World War, so it was a little, little bit later, but uh, in the 19th century, being Marxist uh, did not exclude being, uh, mm, uh, let's say, the, the followers of uh, the idea of the independent Poland. Yes, so. Uh, this was quite interesting, but of course, uh, there was another tendency, uh, equally interesting tendency within the Polish socialist movement. Uh, the tendency which was um, embodied in uh, the social democracy of uh, the Polish kingdom. Uh, later, they added to the name of the Polish kingdom and Lithuania. And uh, of course, the most important person, the most important uh, thinker within this movement was uh, worldwide known Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, we often uh, tend to, to forget, uh, I mean, a lot of people in Poland not only tend to forget, but would like to forget that uh, Rosa Luxemburg was born in Zamosh, uh, one of the cities in uh, today's uh, eastern part of uh, Poland, and that she was very active within the Polish revolutionary movement. So the, her first steps in the European revolutionary movement, as we all know, we, we, we know her activities in Germany, yes, so we, we all know her uh, practical and theoretical engagement in uh, the German Communist Party, but uh, nevertheless, her first steps, her first political steps, as well as uh, her first uh, writings were written about Poland and for the Polish revolutionary and socialist movement. And uh, at uh, this moment, I would like to stress that Rosa Luxemburg, which was quite interesting and uh, for me, it's still fascinating to, to discover her writings from that time. Rosa Luxemburg wrote that, uh, of course, uh, not the independence, not the statehood of Poland is the most important thing for the revolutionary movement or should be the most important thing for the revolutionaries in Poland, but rather uh, the fight for uh, the workers' cause and the fight for revolution without or regardless of uh, the borders of different states and nation state as well yes so uh, on the one hand she was uh, neglecting the idea of um, the so-called uh, independentist uh, current within the socialist movement but on the other hand one must uh, remember that in the year 1900 uh, she has published a very interesting book on nationhood uh, the book was published in uh, one of the western german occupied cities of poland uh, in uh, poznan and in that book, uh, commenting on the, let's say, cultural and educational policy of uh, the German Reich, the Reich inspired by uh, Otto von Bismarck, uh, the Reich trying to eradicate all, uh, let's say, cultural identity, whole cultural identity of uh, Poland and Polish people. Uh, she uh, wrote that, uh, well, uh, regardless of the fact that she was very, let's say, in modern times, internationalist, she defended the right of local people uh, for their for preserving their cultural language and so on. So this is one of the most important brochures of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, but in my opinion, quite uh, forgotten now. 
and uh, often even rejected by those who uh, seem to be inspired uh, by uh, Rosa Luxemburg. So Rosa Luxemburg was not, uh, uh, it was not the matter that Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg was, uh, let's say, against the issues of national identity, fighting for national identity, cultural identity and so on. She was rather criticizing the nation state as such, uh, and not uh, the nationhood on, or existing nations uh, on their cultural uh, level, on their level of language identity and uh, culture, which which was quite interesting, uh, at least for me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, I have mentioned the first group. The first group was uh, uh, focused on creating uh, the Polish Socialist Party, the Polish Socialist Party, which was uh, definitely uh, stronger than the, uh, let's say, internationalist uh, groups who, who uh, due to several divisions and uh, conflicts within the Socialist Party, were leaving the social, the mainstream Socialist Party, which uh, was quite independentist. Uh, and there we had several, let's say, followers of the so-called uh, patriotic socialism, as they called that. Uh, particularly, I would mention here uh, Kazimierz Kerles Kraus, uh, but also one of the veterans of the socialist movement who was also active uh, in the uh, period after the First World War in, in the independent Poland, uh, uh, Bolesław Limanowski. So we had a lot of uh, thinkers uh, uh, on both sides, let's say, but I would say that politically um, the Polish Socialist Party was uh, uh, rather well, definitely it was stronger in terms of uh, its uh, numbers, numbers of its followers, number, numbers of its members and so on, than the, uh, let's say, internationalist current who didn't pay so much attention to the statehood, Alto, still defended the rights of uh, cultural identity, the issues of uh, uh, language, for instance, using Polish language and so on. Uh, Coming back to Rosa Luxemburg, one, one more important thing. Rosa Luxemburg was, uh, in my opinion, uh, analyzing in a fascinating way, by the way, uh, the um, economic ties, the economic dependencies between uh, different parts of uh, the uh, partitioned Poland and their, um, let's say, uh, capital states, which means Russia, uh, Prussia, Germany, and uh, Austro-Hungary. And she pointed out that actually the, uh, let's say, development, uh, also the, the, the class development, development of, of social class, of the working class uh, in all that uh, respective parts of Poland was, uh, uh, well, uh, something quite natural concerning the fact that those uh, parts were economically tied and very closely connected to uh, the uh, monarchies, to the empires in which they existed. So she perceived the, the, the independence of Poland as, uh, as a state, not as a nation, I, I uh, emphasize, but as a state, as something which might, uh, let's say, uh, slow down uh, the class formation and the uh, uh, eventually the, the, the revolution which uh, uh, could happen only in the conditions, of course, of uh, first coming from the feudal uh, stage of uh, development to the uh, bourgeois, to the, um, uh, let's say, capitalist stage of development. It was particularly important for Russia, yes, for, for, for the Russian part. Actually, if you see, if we see, uh, if we look at and analyze the social structure and uh, uh, let's say also the geographical um, details of uh, the economic development of uh, the part of Poland, which was uh, part of Russian Empire, we can notice that there were a lot of industrial centers, uh, which were, uh, well, quite uh, a good uh, and fertile ground for revolutionary movements. You can see, for instance, uh, the city of Łódź uh, in the central part of uh, Poland created as a classical, uh, let's say, uh, point of uh, concentration of economical power of the rising bourgeoisie, uh, which was also naturally a kind of a, um, let's say, a place where uh, 
the revolutionary workers movement was uh, developing uh, very very fast i would compare this city to to the conditions of uh, large uh, russian cities large cities of a russian empire like uh, then St. Petersburg and uh, Moscow, because it was equally, uh, let's say, dominated by uh, the um, uh, class war, the class conflict between the bourgeoisie and the, the workers. So uh, the, uh, the socialist movement uh, of the 19th century and early 20th century had uh, those basic two currents, which are still somehow let's say, affecting the socialist thought of uh, Poland, even the contemporary one, I, I think. Also, of, of course, uh, as we all know, and this is a topic for another discussion, we have another experience for, for Polish uh, socialist movement, which is the uh, Polish history after the Second World War. Nevertheless, uh, still uh, some works of uh, Rosa Luxemburg, on the one hand, on the other hand of uh, Keles Kraus or Limanowski might be inspiring for contemporary debates in our country. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think that the, the most crucial things about in this discussion about independence, it is, uh, it is question of the uh, first uh, half of the occupation in Poland where there was a lot of um, uprising and the Polish socialist movement was uh, the beginning serious beginning of this movement it is 19, 1870s it is the time after the fall of the uh, January uprising 1863-1864 but it was one of the many uprising before this uprising we had a uh, uh, move, movement, conspirational movement in uh, 1840s, and also we have uh, a big uprising in 1830. And uh, in all the time, we have the some conspirational movement who wants to continue one more time the uprising. So, uh, so uh, the question was that the, the people who wanted to organize uprising, they came from the nobles, they came from the aristocracy. So the people who create the Polish socialist movement in eight, in seven in the seventeenth uh, 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 century, uh, they uh, for them the perspective is that uh, we are uh, against the nobles. And because nobles want to make uh, insurrection, uh, we we are against insurrection because insurrection uh, it is the time when the all class are have to uh, be unite against the occupants, and because of this unification, the class question is not existing and it is it was very important for example for the uh, january uh, insurrection when the in the time when the tsar uh, make a reform of the peasants it was finish of the of the uprising because the polish peasant want to uh, didn't support the polish nobles uh, so um, this discussion was started, I think, in the time in the before the creating of party proletariat. There was continuation this discussion in the time of SDKPL, SDKPL and the Polish Socialist Party. But uh, I think that the most important was not a question independence or not independence. It is the question that there were the people. Uh, who didn't want it one more time make uprising, uh, uprising created by the nobles, and they can they couldn't imagine the situation when the Polish working class are uh, interesting about the question uh, of the independence and the situation in the revolution 1905 changed totally uh, subject because in insurrection in the revolution 1905 we have situation when the we have the mass workers movement and this one mass workers movement use uh, red flag 
but also use the flag of uh, Poland, uh, red and uh, red and white. And there is the, a lot of Polish uh, Polish workers who, uh, in the same time, they fight for the uh, social question, but they fight, for example, for the Polish language in the schools uh, because uh, they were against the Russification. And it was something that nobody uh, in ni 19th century can imagine because for them. This, this discussion about the independence, it was only a discussion about the allies. By the, they can, uh, and also it was true that, 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 that uh, before this, uh, the, the working people, peasants or workers, are not interested in this question. They're starting to be interested in the rise of the nationalism in, in all Europe. Uh, and it is something that uh, uh, that uh, when when uh, I think that it was the most important question for Lenin, that Lenin, who was also the big supporter of the Polish independence, when he see that the Polish workers support independence, uh, so he had, he he was in very very difficult situation because in one in one side. He was a Marxist. He respected Rosa Luxemburg, uh, and he he didn't like Piłsudski and the Polish Socialist Party because the Polish Socialist Party was uh, have a lot of contact with these reformists in the uh, international socialist. But in the second, uh, in the other way. Uh, he see that uh, this question of the Polish independence it is not question only uh, the allies and uh, you um, you ask question where this movement uh, socialist movement was the most uh, important i think that this movement was not in the 1870s or 1880s it was not question russia prussia or or germany or austria i think that it was the france uh, france and switzerland because most of the discussion taking place in the emigration and 100 person in the emigration they came from aristocracy all these uh, leaders uh, all these creators of the uh, polish socialist movement like uh, in in uh, other socialist movement, they came from the from the privileged privileged class. Um, what do you think about this? Oh, uh, well, on on the one hand, I would agree with you that they came from privileged class, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you have to take into account that uh, well, I would say that most of them definitely were members of that new social class which which I have mentioned and uh, which was called at that time in intelligentsia and uh, those people were well uh, practically economically deprived uh, as we see and as we read the memoirs of those people or at least most of them of course there were some exceptions but at least most of them living somewhere in Switzerland or uh, in uh, uh, France for instance uh, were living in very poor conditions, as we know. Uh, and, uh, well, you can see that uh, the stories, uh, for instance, uh, of uh, even the representatives of, uh, let's say, revolutionary movements, definitely more powerful than the Polish one, uh, like, for instance, uh, Georgi Plekhanov, the pioneer Russian Marxist, who, who also lived in Switzerland and in France in, uh, well, conditions which were uh, like, you know, like he was a member of not even a working class, but, uh, but of, of the, of the lowest classes, lowest social classes in, uh, uh, in the West. So mm, the conditions, of course, they, they were all coming from, from the nobleman, or at least uh, most of them were coming from the nobleman. But on the other hand, still they were, uh, let's say, living the lives of, um, the, pauperized uh, intelligentsia, so living in poverty, in, in most cases at least. Uh, of course, you are right that uh, uh, if we see the intellectual debates, most of the, I mean, most of the Russian uh, uh, revolutionary movement, including the Polish part of uh, that time Russia, uh, lived abroad at that time. Uh, definitely, yes, particularly after uh, 1881, so after the, the 
uh, killing of uh, Tsar uh, Alexander II uh, by a Polish anarchist, as, as we have already mentioned. Uh, so, uh, particularly after after that period and the period of uh, repressions in the in the Tsarist Russia, most of them had to emigrate, and and they were all uh, discussing the future of the socialist movement there. Nevertheless, those people, or at least most of them, uh, the Polish socialists, were in the milieu and were, let's say, uh, debating the future of the revolution mainly in the circles of other. Uh, socialists and revolutionaries coming from Russian Empire. So, uh, to be precise, I, I was not meaning the, let's say, the territory of, uh, I, I, I didn't mean the, the territory of uh, the Russian Empire, to be more precise, but uh, let's say the cultural and uh, polit political circles coming from the Russian Empire also uh, in the West, also living in France and uh, Switzerland. When it comes to the class structure, I think it's very interesting what, what you have just said that about, uh, let's say, the differences or a kind of uh, new quality of the Polish uh, revolu revolutionary and socialist movement after uh, the year uh, 1905. And the revolution, uh, uh, the Russian revolution of that year, and also the Polish revolution. I have mentioned Łódź, so one of the most important events of that time, revolution of, of the revolution of 1905, uh, had taken place uh, actually in Łódź, uh, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, protests of the workers, of the working class, and uprising of the working class actually there, uh, by the way. But uh, what was the reason for that? Uh, actually, well, if you look at the 19th century, you have you have analyzed the social structure of the 19th century Poland. The social structure of the 19th century Poland was uh, not a capitalist one, but a feudalist one. Uh, actually, you have mentioned the peasants, for instance. Yes, so uh, in all those uprisings you have mentioned, the November uprising uh, in the 30s, the uh, January uprising in the beginning of the 60s of the 19th century, uh, all those up uh, uprisings uh, were, of course, led by the noblemen. Some of those noblemen, for instance, uh, during the January uprising, uh, the so-called red faction uh, within the uh, group of leaders of uh, the uprising uh, intended to get support from the peasants, yes, but uh, no one was talking, uh, even in uh, uh, 1863 then, no one was talking about uh, the working class because actually there was no working class uh, in Poland at that, at that time, yes. We were in a process of the beginning of uh, the class formation here in Poland. So, uh, actually, I would say that uh, Thanks to, let's say, some uh, uh, natural development of uh, <clears throat> the uh, society, of the economy, of, of the evolution from the feudalist one to the capitalist stage, uh, we uh, had our own working class uh, actively engaged in politics in 1905, before there was no social background for uh, the socialist working uh, class because it, it 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 hadn't existed here yes in uh, in Poland uh, the discussion as such was actually very very interesting the discussion was about the role of working class and the possibility of uh, igniting uh, starting a revolution without having uh, this uh, stage of capitalist development without having working class. Uh, on the basis of uh, peasants was uh, very fascinating in uh, Russia, in also also in some circles in Poland, there were discussions um, uh, to, to what extent it would be possible to uh, engage and to, let's say, create a, a class identity of Polish peasants, yes? Um, nevertheless, uh, well, it was quite uh, quite hard to do that. And uh, as we had seen in uh, the January uprising particularly, most of the peasants were taking the side of the Tsarist uh, monarchy, of the Tsarist regime, actually. Of course, there was an uh, objective reason for that. That was the thing you have told about uh, the, uh, the reforms of, uh, of the Tsar when it comes to the uh, land reform, yes? 
uh, in, uh, in, in all the Russian Empire. And uh, on the other hand, the Polish uh, revolutionary movement, the Polish leaders of the uprising, because, well, we can hardly call them revolutionary movement, of course, in socialist terms. Nevertheless, the uh, leaders of uh, the uprising uh, were unable to address the uh, social needs and also unable to address and understand and communicate with the peasants because they were coming from completely another social class, uh, completely another social and cultural uh, background uh, they had, yes. So uh, that's why, uh, well, regardless what uh, Marx or Engels wrote about uh, the Polish uprisings and the Polish revolutions of the 19th century, they couldn't have had a class character at that time because there was no uh, class consciousness among the peasants or uh, almost no class consciousness so well some might discuss that for instance in 1846 during the uh, peasants rebel in uh, galicia in um, uh, the southern part uh, uh, of poland controlled by uh, austria at that time by habsburg empire there was some part of uh, let's say symbolical uh, or at least very, very simplistic uh, class uh, consciousness among the peasants. Uh, we, of course, have heard about the rebel of uh, Jakub Szela and uh, the so-called Galician rebel at that time, but uh, nevertheless, it was not a class movement. Uh, and moreover, it was sometimes used, it's another interesting thing, that it was sometimes used or abused by uh, the uh, empires, the monarchies controlling Poland, uh, which were playing um, and igniting the conflicts between the, let's say, independentist uh, noblemen in Poland, independentist aristocrats and the peasants, yes. So, and well, generally, generally the peasants uh, were taking uh, usually the side of, uh, of the empires controlling uh, Poland and of their emperors and monarchs. So uh, that's uh, that's another interesting question. And uh, when it comes to, um, let's say, the uh, socialist uh, movement as such, uh, well, there was another social group, very important, we cannot forget about it, uh, particularly in the Russian-controlled part of Poland, uh, which was, uh, I think, uh, without any doubts, the leading force, leading revolutionary, uh, force in uh, the social structure of uh, Poland at that time, and it was the Jewish minority. I mean, the, the Jewish minority, which was uh, repressed, actually, and which was uh, uh, in a condition of a separate, uh, not only national or cultural, but also in a, in a condition of separate social class. Yes, I, I, and I'm not talking, of course, about the Jewish bourgeoisie, uh, but I'm talking about the majority of the uh, Jewish population in Poland, which was, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, either uh, close to the in intelligentsia ethos, either, uh, either close to the uh, working class and participating in the working class formation. If you look at Łódź and uh, the tendencies in, in Łódź, you, you didn't have only the, let's say, Jewish bourgeoisie there in, in, uh, in the city of Łódź, but also a lot of Jewish workers. And that's why, uh, uh, well, uh, quite a big part of uh, the theorists and uh, uh, ideologists of uh, revolutionary movement in Poland came from this uh, Jewish milieu. So uh, basically, in, uh, in uh, 1905, you had uh, uh, the first, for the first time, you had a, a let's say, a revolution or a, a endeavor to organize a revolution by a, a self-conscious uh, working class, uh, which was already there, at least in the big cities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you had this uh, Jewish factor of, of, of Jewish revolutionaries, which was not typical only for Poland. I, I uh, would like to stress here that uh, it was a very, very uh, typical situation for all the Russian empire. If you also look at the, uh, let's say, the participation of uh, Jewish revolutionaries in different activities of uh, 
Russian um, uh, movement, uh, let's say in cities like Odessa, but also like in uh, Kharkov and uh, other cities of the of then southern part of Russia and today's Ukraine, you will notice a lot of uh, people coming from from this minority, and uh, well, actually being very very active. Uh, we're talking about uh, Rosa Luxemburg, for instance, but uh, we must also remember that her. Uh, husband Leon uh, Yogihes was also one of the very important uh, uh, thinkers, uh, well, perhaps not as as well known as his wife, but uh, he also had this Jewish background and uh, was one of the, uh, I think, uh, very underestimated uh, uh, intellectuals and uh, activists of the Polish revolutionary movement. Uh, nevertheless, uh, coming back to, 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 to your question, I think that uh, of course, in 1905, uh, you had on the one hand the, mm, let's say, conscious uh, working class movement on the streets of Łódź, of Warsaw, and some other places in Poland. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, there was a, a plan to abuse, to abuse the working class uh, struggle uh, at that time uh, in Poland. Uh, against uh, Russia to turn it, uh, let's say, more and more uh, nationalist or oriented only on independence. Uh, as we know, uh, it was the, the uh, thought of uh, Józef Piłsudski actually uh, very influential at that time in the Polish uh, Socialist Party. And actually he was not, I don't think that in 1905 Piłsudski could be called a socialist. I mean, later after after Poland regained its independence, he he uh, admitted that uh, socialism was used or abused by him as a kind of instrument in, in the fight for independence. So uh, for this part, uh, let's say for the right uh, wing or, or the most extreme right wing of the Polish Socialist uh, Party at that time, uh, the independence was the main issue, yes, of course, and it was uh, uh, used and abused uh, in uh, such events as the revolution of uh, 1905. Uh, I would like to uh, say some words about Rosa Luxemburg that uh, um, she is uh, she is known in Poland like a socialist who was against uh, the in independence because she uh, make a lot of polemic against the party of Józef Piłsudski about the sorry, Polish Socialist Party. Uh, and when she when she started her career in the socialist movement, it was the main topic. It was for her that uh, that the, for her the fighting for the uh, Marxist movement in Poland. It is fight at against the people who are patriotic. But uh, there is other other uh, things in the uh, in the question of Rosa Luxemburg. It is uh, not known. It is uh, I I think that it is uh, I I listen one lecture about the biography of Rosa Luxemburg uh, that uh, when she became a member of the German Social Democratic Party. Uh, uh, most of these uh, German socialists uh, in the public, they say that, of course, they support the Poland and stuff like this. But in private conversation, they said that the, the better way is the Germanization of the Polish minority, which lived in... Uh, it's difficult to say that, that it was a minority because it was a part of the, this German empire where the Polish were majority in the Poznań region or in the Silesia. And they, uh, in the private conversation, uh, all the time repeated that the better way is the Germanization of this, of this stupid Poles. And Rosa Luxemburg was against it. As they start, they start to uh, subscribe the Polish newspapers. They start to promote the Polish culture in Germany, in Berlin, stuff like this. So she, um, so she, when she lived in Poland, she was against the Polish socialist movement in this question. But after she, it is not that they changed her mind, but. Uh, uh, she was. Uh, um, it was one of the questions that she was not respect. Uh, she, she was one of the uh, biggest intellectual in this party, but because of two questions, because that she was 
Polish, Polish origin and because she was woman, she was all, all, always in the second round uh, politician. Uh, so, um, so I think that uh, this is very important question that the, that for this, uh, that the socialist movement, Polish socialist movement, have also this uh, this uh, allies uh, allies in in the uh, international socialist movement, and some of these allies uh, are uh, they 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 are enemies. They, they, Publicly, they said that we, they are allies, but uh, they are enemies. And, um, and uh, for for the question of Piłsudski, what uh, who was Piłsudski in 1905? I think that in 1905 he was socialist. Uh, he was a socialist, uh, and all his political career uh, was that uh, he was. Uh, uh, his father or his grandfather, I think, uh, participated in the ja uh, January uprising, and they lose the um, money. They, 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 they this, this, uh, this nobles, so the was uh, the, the 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 property of this family was taken by the Russia, and uh, he and his brother Bronisław. They uh, they have something in their mind that uh, insurrection it is not this way it, it is not uh, we we need to change the tactics and in the beginning of the revolution 1905 uh, it was they they see that uh, big movement revolutionary the movement of strike in all Russia that uh, it was amazing that that workers can strike in all Russia and Tsar is uh, don't don't know what to do and in in October 1905 he have to make uh, some concession for this revolutionary movement so uh, in 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 this time in 1905 everybody was impressed about the force of the working class the 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 evolution of Piłsudski was after when this uh, movement uh, was destroyed because after the the state the the tsarist state starting to make uh, fight with this workers movement and also the strikes uh, most workers was uh, tired of strikes they lose the jobs many of their were killed and uh, and it this uh, this uh, revolution which is uh, beaten by the state make the, him and the, a lot of other people uh, ch change their mind that they see that we we need to change strategy because uh, the workers will not be uh, with workers it is impo impossible to 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 win and it is why he's starting to search the allies in the austrian empire and uh, try to build uh, the some kind of the polish army dependent by the austria oh uh, there is a question for you uh, uh, but it is out of topic um, so maybe i will i will ask uh, question out of the topic sorry perhaps mr piskorski heard about belmarsh tribunal and has an opinion about it uh, belmarsh tribunal it is uh, it is uh, it is people tribunal uh, organized by the um, people who are solidarity with um, assange so the, I don't know really what is this, but uh... no, no, so, of course this is out of topic. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think we should thank for such a question and raising such uh, topics as well, because uh, well, uh, we can see some continuation between the fight for um, workers' rights before and the fight for uh, freedom of speech uh, nowadays in, in the contemporary world. So I, I think that uh, the fate of Julian Assange is maybe not directly connected to the Polish socialist uh, movement and its uh, history. Nevertheless, uh, it's very important to mention it uh, everywhere. And uh, I would like to voice my strongest support for all people who fight for Assange and uh, who raise this issue publicly everywhere, even if it's out of topic. 
Yes, I have to add that Mateusz Piskorski is Polish, Julian Assange. In three years he was arrested because of, uh, of uh, uh, that you are not the ally of the USA in Poland. So. Yes, I, I, I'm not. I, I, I'm not such a hero as Julian Assange, really, because Julian Assange uh, has done uh, a lot more than, than I have. Uh, I was just uh, functioning locally in Poland, but uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you for reminding um, this fact also to, to our audience. Okay, so what do you think about the evolution of uh, of Piłsudski and also? Uh, this this question of Rosa Luxemburg, she said that uh, fro, from the economic point of view, if Poland will be creating, it will be state uh, with with economy collapsing economy. And this discussion we have today in the time of the movement. Uh, uh, organizing by Donald Tusk and all these people who make demonstrations that we want to be part of the European Union because if Poland will be exclude the European Union, Poland will be lost the these markets and we will have the poverty. So from the perspective of the um, Poly, Poland, uh, 1918-1939, where the economy of Poland was not in good shape. You think that Rosa Luxemburg have right or not? <clears throat> well, uh, she was uh, just acknowledging the facts. Uh, I mean, the fact was that uh, the Polish uh, economy and also the social development and also the formation of social classes, as we have already told, was uh, interconnected or even dependent on the situation and on the development in uh, the countries which were uh, participating in the part partitioning of Poland. So uh, actually uh, Luxembourg was right when she told that, uh, for instance, the, the, the eastern part of Poland is uh, uh, totally economically uh, dependent on uh, the Russian, on the Russian economy. So. Uh, it was just acknowledging the facts, yes, uh, if we compare it to the contemporary times. 70% uh, of uh, uh, the Polish uh, external trade, I mean uh, export and import together, uh, come from European Union countries. This is also a fact, yes. Uh, another question is uh, if, it's, if we are able to change this fact. If uh, we look at uh, what uh, Rosa Luxemburg um, uh, wrote and uh, told, well, actually, of course, I think that uh, if, uh, let's say, the Polish, uh, the Polish uh, state at that time or the Polish lands at that time would, for instance, let's say it uh, hypothetically, theoretically, uh, as a kind of political fiction, uh, would be a part of a Russian Empire and then it would be a part of uh, the Soviet Union after the revolution of 1917, uh, probably, probably the development, the economic, social development, the infrastructure, development of infrastructure of those parts of Poland, which would be a part of uh, the uh, Soviet Socialist uh, Russia uh, or Soviet Union, and that time would be uh, definitely faster than it was uh, in the times of the independent uh, Poland between 1918 and 1939. That's without any doubts. I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, compare, for instance, the uh, eastern parts of Poland, uh, which are now Ukraine, uh, and uh, the same parts of uh, the same territories, but those which were neighboring the uh, Polish uh, eastern lands, eastern regions at that time, but were controlled by the Soviet Union, yes, and compare the level of development of the underdeveloped, uh, uh, almost feudalist uh, part of Ukraine controlled at Poland uh, by Poland at that time in the pre-war period and uh, the industrialized uh, part of uh, Ukraine controlled by the Soviet Union. So from this point of view of, uh, let's say, conditions for economic de economic development, perhaps she was right, but uh, well, we, we cannot verify it, yes? 
actually, because uh, that would be a kind of uh, hypothetic uh, uh, history or a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, political or historical fiction uh, now. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, if we hear that uh, there are some facts uh, showing and proving that uh, we are a part of a larger economic organism, we have two ways. Yes, the one way is to uh, build economy, build, uh, let's say, independent economy. Uh, it was in the pre-war times as, as well as it's uh, actually in the present time. But if you want to build an independent economy, you have to develop your relations with uh, different parts of the world, not focusing only on one direction as it is now in the Western direction. But uh, if we want, for instance, to step out of European Union, which is definitely bureaucratic, uh, which is definitely neoliberal and so on, and, uh, and which is based on the oligarchy uh, of uh, Western European countries, uh, you have first to rebuild your economic ties and uh, economic cooperation with other partners like uh, China, Russia and so on. The same was going for uh, Poland after the First World War, after it regained independence. Nevertheless, uh, if you if you look at the uh, let's say economic history of Poland at that time, uh, you will see that uh, the problem was real because the, the economic unification of Poland was a very hard process and difficult process. Uh, and uh, basically, if you look at all, all almost all the neighboring countries. Uh, not only not only the Soviet Union we have mentioned already, but also, of course, the authoritarian and then totalitarian Third Reich, and then even Czechoslovakia, which was the only democratic neighbor of Poland at that time. Uh, you see that the economic development uh, in all those neighboring countries was uh, more dynamic, faster than than the one in Poland. Yes, so uh, I think like that uh, Rosa Luxemburg was just acknowledging some facts because she was very brilliant when it comes to analyzing the economic and uh, trade connections of uh, uh, Poland with uh, the, ca the countries, the empires which were uh, participating in the partition of our country. I have a question to you um, about the revolution 1905 because all the time we speak about the difference in the socialist movement uh, but uh, it was a time of very, very cruel struggle between the Polish Socialist Party, the workers organized by the Polish Socialist Party, and by the Polish right, especially the right who, who, uh, who collaborated with Russia. They were against this, this strikes movement. Why the Pol uh, these two kinds of Poles uh, who, who wanted, uh, I don't know, uh, Polish language, Polish... Uh, why they, did they fight, did they fight in, the, in the time? When I speak about they fight, it is not that they are uh, fight in, the, uh, in writing polemics. They are the people who killed one of each other in the time of strike. There are the right-wing militia who killed the, the, the Polish workers. So how you explain this? Well, uh, to some extent, the Polish right was controlled by um, the uh, local national uh, oligarchy, we might say. So it was, uh, from the class point of view, it was representing the interests so, which were contrary to the interests of the working class. That's uh, That was quite obvious. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, unfortunately, some of the workers were uh, manipulated uh, because uh, we know that in 1905 and later the Polish, uh, let's say, uh, nationalist circles also tried to organize their own trade unions, for instance, or workers' movements. And uh, that was uh, really a tragedy that at that time, uh, at that time, uh, those two uh, movements which could uh, together represent the interests of working class were fighting each other. Uh, it also was an uh, effect, a result of, uh, uh, let's say, a fundamental 
uh, difference between the strategies of uh, two political camps, uh, which were very important for Poland at that time, uh, personified in uh, the uh, politicians from the one on the, on the one hand it was Piłsudski, on the other hand it was Dmowski. But it's uh, a little bit different issue anyway. Uh, Dmowski was, uh, as you have as you have mentioned, well, Dmowski was. Uh, trying to uh, regain, eventually regain the independence of Poland uh, within the framework of cooperation with the Tsarist Russia at that time. He was a member of uh, the Russian parliament after 1905, uh, creating the Polish faction in the Russian State Duma. Uh, I just want to remind that the creation of State Duma was one of the results actually of the revolution of 1905. Uh, so uh, the socialist uh, movement, uh, that's a paradox, paved the way of uh, Dmowski and some other Polish uh, members of the so-called National Democratic Movement to the Russian parliament and to their uh, political careers yes, as, uh, as parliamentarians in, in uh, Russia, in Russian Empire at that time. So two strategies, two, uh, two uh, let's say, uh, social classes, two groups of uh, people who are, let's say, completely uh, different when it comes to also their system of values, which is not uh, the least important thing, because uh, uh, here you have also the, 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 the influence, influence of, uh, uh, let's say, nationalist circles on at least some part of the, uh, of the working class. So uh, that's... Uh, a very very interesting moment in the in the history of Polish uh, uh, struggle for independence and the uh, Polish uh, workers struggle uh, in 1905, uh, which uh, also to some extent, well, Poland is a country which is uh, uh, all the time, uh, let's say, referring to its own history. So even now we have a lot of discussions about uh, all those. Uh, persons from the from the history of Poland which is which is quite uh, which is quite important uh, that's why that's why I would uh, like to stress that uh, actually I guess that uh, from the point of view of uh, the conflicts at that time it was uh, something uh, well something which showed that uh, at least part of the social of the working class movement in poland uh, might be used or abused by different uh, social classes and by different uh, interests yes so that's uh, the symbolic uh, meaning of uh, of the year uh, 1905 quite important and I have other question that in the um, when the Poland were in the uh, didn't exist it, the socialist movement or progressist movement in all the world, all the Europe was solidar uh, was solidar with, with with Poland, and uh, the this this. Polish Polish socialist um, activist was considered like uh, heroes heroes who struggling struggling for independence. How you analyze the these biographies of these people who, uh, when they were young, 20, 30, they participated in revolution, and 20 years later, when in the time of independent independent Poland many of these people create the allies of the new Poland, uh, so-called Sanacja, and these people was responsible for the uh, with the uh, shameful politic towards the Ukrainians and national uh, question or Belarusian. They try to make the polonization in the East that uh, for, so they in, in in when they were young they fighting for the freedom of, of Polish people and when they were old they became the people who oppressed the other nation. Well, not not all of them. Uh, actually, this is also a quite interesting thing because if you look at uh, we have mentioned Limanowski today, yes. Uh, so uh, he of course was a quite uh, moderate socialist. 
Uh, he was a member of uh, the Polish Socialist Party also in the times of independent Poland. Nevertheless, he remained, let's say, a kind of uh, social democrat uh, of that time, yes. Uh, on, uh, on the other hand, you had a lot of people like Pilsudski himself, which I, uh, well, I would, I would say I would disagree with you when it comes to the evaluation of Pilsudski's socialism. Uh, although you are right that maybe some of his personal experiences like losing his property uh, influenced his, uh, I mean, pushed him towards socialism at a certain moment. Nevertheless, Piłsudski and most of his people, also the guys who are um, the activists who are uh, fighting in the so-called uh, uh, organization of the struggle organization of uh, Piłsudski, the militant organization created by Piłsudski, were not ideologues. They were, uh, let's say, some of them, or at least some of them, were uh, not very ideologically motivated, but they were just, uh, you know, perceiving themselves as uh, uh, professional uh, revolutionaries, but forgetting about the cause of the revolution. So they were just fighting for, for the cause of fighting itself, not for uh, the goals of, uh, uh, or, or the ideology of, of, the, of the revolution. And, uh, and of uh, the social classes which which they claim that they have represented. So uh, I think that in every uh, movement uh, or in almost every, uh, even the most revolutionary movement, you have this problem that uh, on the one hand you have, uh, of course, people who are conscious from the class point of view, people who are ideologically mo motivated, uh, but on the other hand, uh, probably you have the majority of the people who are, uh, let's say, uh, participating in such a kind of movement uh, by coincidence or are, are not very ideologically motivated or even ideologically aware of, uh, of the goals and aims of uh, the movement. Uh, that's why, well, I uh, we cannot see any uh, any of the um, really ideologically motivated and ideologically aware uh, Polish socialists uh, within the ranks of um, uh, Piłsudski military dictatorship after 1926. You can rather see some minor, uh, minor uh, activists from the times of uh, the Polish Socialist Party. Uh, I think that even the reformist social democrats uh, but still somehow ideologically oriented, uh, haven't supported, I mean, no one of them uh, has supported uh, Piłsudski and his cup in 1926, for instance, yes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the fact that uh, I think that neither Piłsudski himself actually, uh, neither um, his closest circle uh, of uh, political uh, comrades from the times of his uh, membership in the Polish Socialist Party were not so uh, ideologically devoted to the socialist cause. They were just uh, uh, using it as an, as an instrument at a certain time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there were some examples, as you have mentioned, that uh, people who at least formally belong to the Polish Socialist Movement uh, before uh, then built, um, let's say, uh, classical authoritarian uh, uh, to a large extent uh, conservative regime uh, of uh, the so-called uh, sanation uh, in the time after the between the first and second world war it might be a paradox but i would not uh, overestimate the quality uh, at least the ideological quality of the cadres of uh, piusudski Oh, in this question, I am uh, agree with you that uh, I not underestimate the uh, underestimate or, uh, but um, I uh, I respect uh, this sacrifice of young people in the time when um, in the revolution when many of the workers were were hanged by the by the police. And it was, uh, we have to remember that after the Bloody Sunday, uh, the participation in the mass movement, it was something that it is very dangerous because the, in, the, the workers fighting with the state 
who have not problem to killing thousands of people like this. Uh, uh, my last question is this question from the chat. Uh, I think that it is very easy question, but Luxembourg was fighting against capitalism. What is Mateusz Piskorski view on her statement, socialism or barbarism? It is relevant today or not? The whole uh, heritage of Rosa Luxemburg is uh, and should be relevant uh, because actually I think that uh, a lot of her thoughts are uh, even uh, uh, presently even more uh, important as uh, the thoughts of other Polish uh, classics of uh, socialist thought. Uh, I think she is the most important for and should be the most important for for all of us when it comes to a kind of intellectual uh, inspiration and uh, that's a pity. Uh, well, to say the least, it's a pity. I, I, would use, uh, I would be using uh, more or less diplomatic language that uh, in Zamość, a city where uh, she was born, a town where she was born in the um, eastern part of Poland, uh, there is no monument of Rosa Luxemburg. And if someone would like to uh, build a monument for Rosa Luxemburg, it would be probably uh, destroyed by the uh, authoritarian, uh, neoconservative, uh, anti anti communist uh, government in Poland, which prohibits. There was, the, I think, there was a kind of uh, sign on, on on the house where she was born and uh, it was also removed or some people wanted to remove it i don't remember at the moment uh, nevertheless uh, that's uh, a part of the legacy of of the legacy of, of the polish thought of the polish socialist thought which should be i think the most important one because it also shows uh, to all of us uh, here in poland that uh, some of our thinkers, the thinkers who are born here, who are uh, living here, who are active here, uh, could uh, become uh, uh, recognized, recognized political revolutionary philosophers, I would say, in case of uh, Rosa Luxemburg, all over the world. So we should be equally proud of uh, Rosa Luxemburg as we are proud of uh, uh, Ma Maria Kiris Kłodowska or uh, other people from other fields who, who are international rec internationally recognized. So, uh, yes, uh, I think that we should all read her works, uh, read her writings, uh, also her writings which uh, were written and uh, published uh, in the times where uh, she was active in Poland in the Polish Revolutionary Movement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, these things, which uh, most of the polls uh, are new from schools, uh, that uh, we, uh, we will interest uh, this uh, about this problem and uh, the, the Marxists from other countries, uh, because uh, it is uh, it is some of the basic question for the history of the communist movement. Uh, I would like to say that the creation of the first international was because of the meeting, uh, meeting organized in London, uh, solidarity with the uh, January, January uprising. And very often Marx, uh, who is the leader of this communist movement, he, openly said uh, the word of solidarity with Polish fight for independence. It was also the important question in the October Revolution. The Polish uh, people uh, participated in the October Revolution. They participated in the civil war. There were 100,000 uh, 100, Poles who fight uh, in the um, in, in the civil war maybe not of all of them supported the the socialism in the bolshevik way but they knew that they fight with the tsarist regime with the white generals who want to uh, uh, who don't allow to poland to be independent so so it was it was this so thank you very much mateusz I will shut the...